All right. Hello, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome uh, to this new edition of the Worldwide Neurodevelopmental um, Series. Uh, today's guest is uh, Silvia Capello from uh, Munich. Before I introduce uh, Silvia, I want to go through the usual round of, uh, of welcoming. So welcome. Hope, er hope everyone is fine. And also uh, briefly, I guess at some point, I, I won't have to do that anymore, remind you that um, you're welcome to make comments on the right side of your screen, um, but more so you're actually welcome to ask questions. There's a little thingy there, a little tab where you can click and ask your question. And um, more importantly, you can in fact um, uh, vote for these questions, which will be useful in the course of, um, of, uh, of the question and answer session at the end. So don't hesitate to vote. Again, also the students, uh, I think it's a good opportunity for you to throw yourself uh, into the not so cold water after all and um, and, and go ahead and, and, and ask uh, things about what you're interested in. So uh, our guest uh, Silvia um, was uh, not trained as a neurologist or neurobiologist but she's actually trained as a pharmacologist, toxic toxicologist. She trained uh, from 2001 to 2006 in part uh, at the University of Bologna but uh, also in part uh, in the lab uh, of, uh, of Magdalena Goetz in, uh, in Munich before doing uh, a postdoc, a relatively short postdoc in the US in the, uh, at Columbia in the lab of, of Richard Vallée. Uh, in 2009, she came back to Germany where she worked as a research um, associate in Magdalena Goetz's lab until 2014 where, uh, when, she uh, became a group leader at the Max Planck Institute uh, of Psychiatry, um, where she's been ever since, in Munich, Germany. So um, Silvia uh, has uh, published a number of really uh, elegant uh, studies over the, over the years. In particular, I think uh, one, uh, one aspect that, 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 that's really uh, underlining her style is the fact that she's able to combine uh, multiple uh, types of models, including mice, uh, organoids in particular, but also making use of existing uh, data in other species to ask questions re relating to uh, normal and abnormal development. And I feel this is a, a really uh, elegant and, and uh, creative way of asking questions, again, not only about normal development, but uh, uh, neuropathology and human disease, and in fact, which she will be uh, telling us about in a few minutes. Um, of course, yes, she bridges that not only together with, you know, traditional cellular or molecular aspects, but also looks at circuits and electrophysiological aspects. So really, really broad approach on, on really important uh, questions. So in addition to uh, her passion for science, uh, Sylvia has a lot of other passions, just to name a few and to give you some impression of, of her character. She actually bikes to work every morning, you know, not on these little city bikes where, um, where you have the little basket in front, but these hardcore uh, racing bike where if, if you don't pedal, you fall. Uh, 35K, she was telling me, so 20-ish 20, 20 miles back and forth, whether it's raining, uh, snowing, or sunshine. And she does that multitasking, of course, because I once had a long conversation with her on the phone while she was biking. Um, so, you know, I guess it tells a bit about her character and the type of science that she does. So Sylvia, it's a real pleasure to have you here and uh, the screen is yours. Looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much. I will start sharing the screen first to see if everything goes correctly. Just give me okay. Do you see everything? Yeah, it's all good. Okay. You're ready to go. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you for the introduction, Denis, but also I would really like to thank you for, uh, for including me and involving me in this very exciting new adventure this this uh, i think is i have been following this series since the beginning i really enjoy i think it's a beautiful way to uh, entertain uh, ourselves during this difficult phase and also uh, to get to know more uh, each other and uh, i will i will tell you what we are doing in the lab so the title is quite vague uh, but i will be more precise now and um, so what we are trying to do is to understand uh, mechanism uh, relevant for human brain development. We are not the only one, but our approach is actually to try to um, 
use, uh, take advantage of, you know, mutation uh, and genes that they are mutated in patients which have malformation of the brain so, or developmental brain disorders to try to understand the basic mechanisms governing uh, human brain development. At the same time, we think that by maybe studying this, this uh, molecular player that obviously they have a relevance during the development, we may uh, find out more about this mechanism and these genes, and this could, you know, bounce back to um, and, and give some help in understanding better these diseases and maybe help at some point in finding the correct um, therapeutic strategies. So I will start with a very brief introduction. We are all neuroscientists, so I thought I will go give a brief introduction. But I put this slide not as always to emphasize actually the differences between our favorite model system, the mouse model, and the human, um, because it's clear, right? So you can see very clearly that the, uh, the brain of a mouse is not just much smaller, but it's also much more complex. And there is no need uh, to tell you uh, that these two are different, but actually to show you similarities between these two systems and how incredibly similar are the, uh, the cellular composition, is the cellular composition and the mechanisms that they are um, there during the developing, uh, the development of the brain. And in particular, I will also uh, tell you a little bit what are the cells that they are um, relevant in this space, the, the development of the brain. So we obviously have um, a lot of neural stem cells during development. These this, uh, cells here, the pink one with this beautiful apicobasal polarity, you can see them. They are here in the mouse and they are very, very similar, almost identical, I would say, in the developing human brain. So these cells, once they um, are dividing, when we start having the wave of neurogenesis, they start generating a variety of other progenitors. So in the mouse, these progenitors, they move basally and as well as in the human, and, and they go more in this subventricular zone. And in mouse, we have in this basal, uh, they're so-called basal progenitor because they are located basally. And we have mostly what we call intermediate progenitor, which are multipolar cells, TBR2 positive. Here we see the first difference in human because uh, these um, basal progenitors in human are not only the intermediate progenitors, but we also have another population of cells which are called basal radioglia, which are very similar to the apical radioglia or neural stem cells, but they only retain the, apical, the basal process and they lose actually the apical process. It's very important here to note that also, the mouse is capable of generating this basal radioglia, so they are not human specific, but they are human enriched. Namely, that in the mouse, there is all the machinery for generating to generate these cells, but they are very, very limited number, while in human, we have a lot of these cells. So it is important to mention that there's been done a lot of work in these uh, last decades to understand more about these uh, cells. And, um, and we have now quite some knowledge, and especially I would like to mention the, the most uh, the first lab that they were investigating these cells. So there's a lot of work from the lab of Arvo Kriegstein, the one of Victor Borel, uh, Wieland Hutten, but also Pierre van der Hagen. So a lot of work has been done in trying to understand uh, the biology of these cells. So then all these progenitors that I mentioned all together during the wave of neurogenesis will generate neurons. And these neurons have to migrate, as you can see here. And here we have another uh, difference between mouse and humans, namely that the human migrating neurons are equipped with slightly different uh, adhesion molecules. This has been shown by the uh, laboratory of, of Rudiger Klein recently. So basically for uh, their proper migration, they have a different molecule on the surface. So this is another point that I wanted to mention as a difference between the two systems. And the last one, it has also been shown in different way in the last uh, in the last uh, period, especially Pioneer's lab in this uh, Pioneer work has been done by the lab of Wilhelm Tutner, but also uh, Oli Reiner, um, that secreted factor and in particular the extracellular metrics are quite relevant and quite different between in between species because they are important to generate mechanical forces and and they can also um, in pattern being expressing patterns so to uh, make uh, this, the tissue softer or stiffer and this is also important for the generation of folds which is clearly something uh, with all these three factor contribute to so 
Um, these are the important steps, the neurogenesis, to then give rise to all these neurons that you see here, subdivided in layers. So every neuron has a specific place where it has to go to be able to connect and to make the appropriate circuit. So each, if anything happened during these steps, we have disorders, brain disorders, which are called associated to human brain development, also so-called neurodevelopmental disorders. And just to give you also a brief overview of that, so they, they can be classified in, in many ways, um, but somehow there is a kind of continuity between the, all these disorders, because many molecules play uh, an important role in many steps, and so it is very difficult to split them completely. But they can be classified as neurological disorder, where consistently they are like cortical malformation, um, which seem to affect mostly the first part, namely the neurogenesis and neuronal migration. While later on, we have more complex diseases like psychiatric disorders, which are more associated to maturation and fine neuronal migration. So it's more like a, a continuum rather than, you know, specific steps. Um, so, but how do we study this, uh, these processes? Because the human brain is not really accessible, right? So uh, we have model system, in vivo model system. Here I just mentioned three for simplicity, uh, but obviously there are many other models. Um, the mouse, of course, is fantastic because we have done a lot of genetic, we can do a lot of genetics on that and we can manipulate in many ways. And obviously we know a lot from the mouse model because we have been studying the mouse model since many years. But I think there are emerging model system which are very, very uh, important and useful for example, the ferret is an excellent model to study the, the development of the folding. And of course, non-human primates are very important to refine actually our uh, finding. So, but we are lucky enough to be in a phase in which we also have human model systems. So of course they are not in vitro, in vivo, they are in, vi in vitro. So they have the limitation of edge, every in vitro system, but still they give us the chance to then look at specific human features. Um, and we, we have a variety of these models now, so we can go for 2D flat cells in a dish to study the property of single cells, but we can also go more complex and generate organoids or assembloids to then look at the cells in a specific cellular context, so next to the cells that they should also have in vivo. But of course, they have their own limitations. So um, just briefly, I wanted to introduce the model system because in the lab we, use, we do extensive use of mouse models, but we also use a lot recently this in vitro uh, human model system, particularly the 2D system and the organoids and the assembloids. So um, I will tell you about two projects. Uh, they are kind of related. One is going from basic to disease, and the other one is from disease to basic. It's just to tell you how we try to tackle uh, you know, questions by going from one side to the other uh, of uh, the, 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 the things. So basic to, de to disease, disease to basic. So this is about how the brain folds. And as I told you already, one very important cell population that is involved in brain folding at this base already here. So this is a project of Christina Kiruzi, a fantastic postdoc in my lab. And uh, quite some years ago, and you will see from, from this uh, kind of uh, almost uh, old database, this is one of the first databases that came out from uh, the lab of Arnold Krigstein. Yeah. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Apparently, there's a little pop up there. Do you see it on your screen, crowdcast.io? Yes. Yeah, right. can you? Well, exactly. And I guess click to close message. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'll go back. I just have to find back this one. Exactly. Okay. Ah, perfect. Yes, yes. Thank you. No, thank you that you told me. Sorry for that. So, um, exactly. So from this um, old, uh, old is just a few years ago, but I think is uh, is a very important uh, database that was published from uh, from the lab of Arnold Krigstein, in which they actually. Um, sequence single cells from a uh, fetal brain. So this was an ex um, exciting moment because we could actually look at the feature of all the cells of the developing brain. And one of the feature, of course, since this base already is shown by, uh, by that lab to be, for example, um, having some markets, including, for example, OPEX, which is considered the market that is mostly enriched in this base radioglia, that they are also called outer radioglia. 
So we decided to have a look at genes that they actually co-express in the same cells in which we have this market that is um, enriched in basal radioglia. And one of these genes that actually Christina found was this Elgales 3 bp which is a galactin binding protein. So if you look at the, at, the, at the cells, you can clearly see that the pattern of expression is very similar. So we also have a look now, this is a much more recent uh, database from the lab of Barbara Troidland. You can see clearly that also in organoids, that is the model system that you mostly use, you can clearly see that these cells also seems to be in the organoids expressing the same cells. But not only this, I mean, another very important information and reason why we decided to study this gene is when you look in a, another database, actually from the lab of Willem Hutner, this is also from uh, Marta Florio from 2005, you can clearly see that uh, uh, this Elgalis TBP not only is expressed in this specific cell population, which is based on radioglia, but also is absolutely not expressed in mouse. So it's not human specific, but it's, hum it's enriched in the developing brain of human compared to mouse. So absolutely absent in mouse. And when you look a bit more from an evolutionary perspective, uh, you can see that indeed also at the single cell level, this has been done later from the lab of the knee actually, you can see that it's absolutely absent in the mouse while expressing human. And if you look also in other species and you look at the human organoids um, compared to other type of organoids, for example, from chimp and macaque, you can clearly see that the more you go to uh, human, the more is expressed. And indeed macaque organoids have very little expression of this gene. So with that initial information, we started to look at the expression of the protein in the mouse. And you can clearly see that we confirmed that in the mouse is absolutely not expressed. And with the help of uh, the lab of Alex Buffet in Paris, um, they actually did the staining in uh, fetal tissues. And you can see that as very early at gestational week 14, for example, that's enriched in apical progenitors. But later on, when the outer subventricular zone is becoming more prominent, uh, you can see much more of the staining of Elgais 3 bp in the outer subventricular zone. That's look like dirt, but it's not. This is dots because this is a secreted protein. So it's very difficult actually to look at the expression because it's all a secreted protein. And um, when you look in details, you can clearly see that Elgalis 3 bp it always colocalized with the progenitors, so the SOX2 population, which in the outer subventricular zone are the base already clear, but not with the new and uh, positive neurons. And we obviously look also in the organoids, which is our model system. And you can see that uh, like in human at the beginning is expressed quite broadly in the ventricular zone, in the progenitors, while later on is moving to more basal position. At the single cell level, we could also see in our organoids that is um, in radioglia, so it's in progenitors rather than neurons. And it's actually by looking at the timeline. So we look at organoids at different stages. We can see that the expression of this gene just come before the expression of OPEX, which is what we consider the market for basal radioglia. So this was enough for us for starting to manipulate this gene in the organoids. So we did very simple things at the beginning. We just overexpress the gene and downregulate the gene in the organoids by electroporation. And as you can see, the morphology of the ch cells changed quite dramatically. So you overexpress it and you have very big change. Uh, so they lose the uh, apico-basal morphology, while if you downregulate it, they actually have very strong processes attached to the apical surface. Um, but we wonder if the cells that they change morphology actually become basoradioglia, so express uh, this OPEX. And indeed, we have an increase in the um, uh, number of OPEX positive cells and suggesting that the apical cells become basoradioglia. This was also confirmed again by the lab of Alex Basque in Paris in human tissue. So they uh, did, we have done very uh, little amount of experiment because this is a precious tissues, tissue, but we could confirm, they could confirm, but I, by um, electroporating, overexpressing at Gallus TBP, by just looking at the outer subventricular zone, we had an increase in SOX positive cells, SOX2 positive cells. So suggesting it also in the human fetal tissue, we have an increase in this space already agree. So um, to come to our kind of first conclusion and hypothesizing new things, so we see that by, all, by expressing this gene, we have a shift from apical cells to basal cells. So the question was like, we know that the mouse is capable of producing these cells because has the machinery to do that, but doesn't have them or a very, very little amount. So can we force the expression in the mouse and have 
um, a generation of human based radiaglia in mouse. So what we did was to overexpress this uh, LGALA 3 bp in uh, utero, in the developing mouse cortex. And as you can see immediately, you can see that there were some cells detaching from the apical side. You can see them here and forming this cluster. And um, yeah, in mouse, OPEX, as you can see, is also in apical progenitors. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they are base already clear because they are OPEX positive, but the position suggests uh, that they generate some kind of um, outer subventricular zone. So to be sure that that was the case, first of all, we look at other markers. So these cells, they are also positive for other markers of base already glia, like PAC6 and TDR2. And maybe of note that you will get back to, I will get back to this point later, a lot of cells actually of these progenitors that they are positive here are not green. So suggesting that algal STBP, which is a secreted molecule, generate kind of a niche of uh, information. So a niche where the cells change uh, their identity. So obviously, uh, if these cells have the function of basal radiaglia, they should also promote folds and they should be important for cortical expansion. And this is also what we observe when we look at later stages. So this is a P0. You can see again that not all the green cells are involved in a fold, but there are more cells involved in a fold. But you can clearly see that we have a complete change in the lateral side compared to the non-electroporated side. And sometimes we even see the basement membrane along, um, aligned on top of these folds. And uh, this fold contain upper layers neurons, as you can see here, uh, but you can also see that they contain deep layer neurons. And this is the quantification for P0, but we have done that also at P7, and we have exactly the same thing. So the majority of the mice that were electroporated displayed folds. So um, at this point, we are convinced somehow from this data, but by overexpressing this gene, we can have this generation of basal radiaglia in human tissue, but also in the mouse. So um, we were wondering, and this was the moment where I was thinking, what, what about all the species? We don't have so many information about human, the, the developing human brain and all the genes, or how they are expressed in pattern or not. But actually, we were thinking about another mother system, which is the ferret, because uh, the ferret has been a bit more studied, especially from the lab of Victor Borel. And what he has done that I found very beautiful is this uh, micro dissection of um, ventricular area where there are pro progenitors in two different regions, one that will generate the surcus and one that will generate the gyrus. And he has done um, you know, transcriptome analysis of these areas. And basically, what was very interesting, not only that Elgalis 3 bp is expressed and not absent like in the mouse, but actually it's much more uh, enriched in this area. So it's more than double the expression in this area compared to this area. So suggesting that in gyrified species could be expressed in pattern uh, in correspondence to uh, where you will generate, the, the brain will generate a fold. So this for us was interesting enough to, to question, uh, to investigate if they are uh, people, individual, that they have mutation in this gene. And I have a long lasting collaboration uh, with Steven Robertson here from New Zealand and Adam O'Neill also, and uh, Isabel actually from my lab, went also to, uh, uh, to New Zealand to help finding uh, this, uh, these mutations. And what, uh, what uh, they could find immediately as a big court of patient with cortical malformation immediately found this patient, patient one, with, uh, with a mutation in lgal vp in exome 5, which has um, neuronal migration defects. And uh, later on, we found two additional patients with uh, a mutation in lgal vp still in exome 5, say, same exons, also with abnormality of the CNS, one also with microcephaly. So we were capable of getting the information, all the information about patient one and two. Uh, so this is the name when you will see later uh, this, this uh, the construct or the patient, because this is the, the uh, official mutation. So what we did, obviously we were interested in something correlated with basal radioglia and folding. And for that, uh, we asked help to Renzo Guerrini, actually, that is an expert in doing morphometric analysis of the brain by using MRI scans. What he did was to uh, basically look at the cortical thickness in this brain in detail and the gyrification index, the local gyrification index. And what we could see that there are spots in the brain of patient one with 
changes in the um, thickness, but also changing in the gyrification. So this for us was very exciting because we were coming from um, um, from very different species, from organoids to the mouse models, and now to real uh, human, and seeing that this gene and this protein is essential for having proper basal radia glia that we give rise to proper forms. When we look at patient two, we have also very much more striking because as you can see again, also here, you have big changes in the thickness of the cortex as well as in the local gyrification. So this for us uh, was uh, interesting enough to generate this contract. This has been done by Alex Belka, a student that was helping Christina. Um, so he generated a contract with the single point mutations of the two patients that we had. So the 370K and the 294K, electroporated in the mouse brain, and this is the outcome. So uh, basically, this modified, this variants that they are present in patients, they are still generated so we have a protein is actually secreted uh, but they um, but the thing that we see is that they are less functional so when you look at the very severe patient with the one with the big changes in the brain actually very little um, uh, amount of mice they had actually some faults so suggesting that it's very little functional this protein well if we look at the milder patient we had uh, more faults, but not certainly not like the uh, controller galestibility, suggesting that the function of the protein is not as good as the one of the wild one. So we decided to investigate if these different variants of Elgala 3 bp have different binding partners. For that, we also have a beautiful collaboration with uh, Stefan Sieber, Sieber and Pavel Kielkowski um, in Munich uh, that they did, uh, um, they help us a lot with mass spec and with protein analysis. So what we did was very dirty and quick. So we overexpressed in neuroblastoma cells the wild type form of the protein, the two mutant form, then we uh, did interactome studies and we look at the partner. So when we look at the, uh, first of all, they have in common uh, Elgalis 3 bp So this is known from the literature that can dimerize. So they bind to each other. Elgalis 3 bp can bind to each other, including the mutant form. We also know that there are two partners that they are only present in the wild type. So one is an unconventional myosin. The other one is a zinc finger protein with and then we have a few in common between the mild uh, phenotype version and the control one. Um, and we have actually, and this was very surprising, so surprising, a lot more binding partner in the mutant. And this may suggest uh, that actually this Elgal mutant form can sequester other, um, other important protein and maybe impair the function. And one of this is filamin A, which is a super important protein for brain development and patient with mutation always have neuronal migration defects. So altogether the data for us, they were um, uh, important enough to decide to generate by a CRISPR-Cas some, um, some uh, IPS with the mutation of the patient. So we uh, have generated patient one mutation, uh, but we also decided uh, to generate another knockout of uh, exome five, which would resemble, let's say, all the three mutation occurring in patients. So that was our idea because we started by patient one. And uh, they have these two names, 370 k is the usual, but this is a truncated form of the protein without exon 5, which is called Y366L. So um, uh, we look at the, um, the organoids generated by uh, the different iPS cells. Keep in mind that two mutants are basically almost identical in all our studies. We see that they, they are maybe a bit smaller ventricles, uh, but when we look at the, by fax analysis, Rosella did all the fax characterization of all the cell types. So we look at progenitors, we look at base radioglia, we look at neurons, we don't see any difference. So basically they produce all the cells uh, like uh, in controls. What was actually interesting, including the OPEX positive uh, basal radioglia, what was actually interesting was the position of the OPEX positive cells. In control, you clearly have this OPEX positive cells here in basal position, while in the mutant, we often observe ventricles with a lot of these cells, as you can see here, that they are actually at the ventricles, so suggesting that they don't manage always to delaminate and go to the right place. Again, this is a lot of ventricle that we have uh, with diff difference, but again, the number of OPEX positive cells is not changed. It's just the position. So suggesting that these cells can start their program, but somehow they have a, a mechanical uh, uh, 
reason why they actually don't move to the right place. So basically all uh, cells stay in the stage um, morphologically look like apical radiatria. So in addition, uh, patient one has also neurons that they didn't migrate properly. And when we look at the, uh, the neurons in this organoids from patient one, we also clearly see that many of the neurons actually stay in the ventricle. We don't know exactly the mechanism for that. We imagine that maybe if you have these cells, the basoradial glia, that they specify, but they don't manage to go away, the neurons that they are born around them, they may be uh, misleaded. So um, I've told you a lot of information and how all these organoids and brains look like, but I've not focused very much on the function of these genes. And now I want to uh, come to a mechanism. So what is Elgales TBB and where it is located? So first of all, as I told you already, is a protein that is secreted, but when it's secreted, it's interacting with a huge network of protein, which are very uh, complex to study because they are all the collagens, fibronectin, uh, tetraspanin. So this is quite difficult because they are all in the extracellular space. And if you want to see it in a more uh, cellular way, this is a cell, and you can see that it's interacting with, with a lot of matrix protein, as well as these tetraspanins and integrins, which are in the membrane of maybe a receiving cells. So that's why we were a bit uh, tempted to go for something a bit more broad as an analysis, because it's complex to study each of these possible interactors. So what we did was, again, with, uh, with our friend Barbara and uh, two of their lab, uh, we decided with Agnieszka and Zizong, we decided to do, again, single cell sequencing uh, of the three uh, genotypes of the organoids. And uh, what, uh, what we did was basically, so this is uh, the, the result of the single cell sequencing. We can see that in red, this is a dorsal trajectory. So the cells that we want to analyze the most because these are uh, what reproduce the cortical cells. And uh, these are all the markers. And you can see that we try to isolate also what are the ORGs or the base radial clear. And uh, by looking at these uh, genes, we could see actually there are quite some genes that they are still regulated. But in particular, I want to point out that when you look at outer radioglia cells or base radioglia, in control, we have a lot, while with the two mutants, we have very little amount. So this ORG signature are not just OPEX, but there are a variety of markets. And of course, even if OPEX is expressed, it's not sufficient to give them the signature of being an ORG. So less. Uh, base are radio clear in our organoids. So we also did proteomic analysis of these organoids because we know that protein is generated and is secreted. And so what we see is when we do proteomic on this organoid, we see that basically all the neurogenesis cascade uh, is appearing. So it seems to be a protein that is quite relevant for neurogenesis. But when we look at this and try to intersect these two data sets, so proteome, single cell sequencing, and these are just the upregulated genes, we see actually that only few are uh, common in the proteome and uh, RNA sec. And uh, we see that there are quite some uh, glial markers, but especially we have as a first um, FABP7. FABP7 is, uh, or BLBP, is the gene that is a, uh, traditionally a market for radial glia, and you can see that it's increased, so suggesting really that we are maintaining this apical radial glia identity and not shifting to base or radial glia. So in addition to that, we found quite some genes that they were dysregulated related to collagens and the cellular matrix and tetraspanins, uh, which were also expected because these are interactor of Elgalis TVP. And uh, actually, these tetraspanins were quite striking for us because um, I, I, we found quite some papers in which they show that CD81, for example, is important for regulation of uh, the distribution of actin fibers, while CD89 and CD82 can modulate beta catenin. Of course, if you think at the, um, at the identity and the morphology of apical radioglia on one side is definitely attached and anchored to the, uh, to the apical side by junction, f actin beta catenin. So uh, the, the question is, was obvious. So do we have any change in these molecules? And so we went back to the data from organoids and mouths of the electroporation. We could clearly see that as soon as you electroporate uh, Elgalis TBP, you loosen the adherin junction. You can see it here. So suggesting that we actually have loosen of the junction and this uh, is in favor of the delamination. Same things happen when you look at F-actin. You can see clearly that it's disappearing. 
when we actually look at the organoids and mutant organoids from the patient, we can clearly see that this is the opposite. So we have a very, very thick belt of effectin, so suggesting that this is uh, somehow inhibiting the cells in delaminating because it's really uh, maybe a mechanical force that holds the cells on the apical side. So um, obviously uh, the second question was like, okay, algalis TBP we know is secreted. So can we have a look at uh, secreted algalis TBP? And again, with the help from, from uh, Stefan and Pavel, we decided to collect the medium from uh, this organoid to investigate what was different in the medium. So again, uh, this was a um, full mass spec analysis and what we could see uh, from this geotherm uh, that they were up in the secret home of this uh, mutant organoids was regulated exocytosis, secretion, vesicle mediated transport, matrix organization. So we thought, and this was done with the help of a neural student in the lab, Pier Paolo, with Cristina, they, we decided, we designed a very tedious experiment. So we took all our organoids, control and mutant, and we did medium switch. So every day, Pier Paolo went to the lab and exchanged the medium, or also added some fresh medium, but exchanging the medium of the organoids and gave the mutant medium to the wild type organoids and vice versa. What happened is uh, to make all this graph, complicated graph, uh, simple is that basically the control medium rescue completely the phenotype of the mutant organoids. Was not the case or vice versa because probably you can imagine that um, for one day in the niche, you still, the, or the control organoids secrete the right algalis QBP, and maybe that's sufficient because they constantly secrete. But just giving some good algalis QBP to the mutant organoids was sufficient to rescue. Um, yes, and, and, and then we decided to go to something a bit more specific. So it has been published very recently that algalis has been found in the cerebrospinal fluid and has been found in, in vesicles. And the vesicles that they described in the paper, uh, thinking about the size, uh, they are very similar to what uh, are um, called exosomes. So exosomes are um, exocellular vesicles, they are quite small, they have this transmembrane protein, which are the tetraspanning, exactly what the are the protein that they bind at Gallus TBP. They also have all the protein, enzyme, metabolites, even microRNA and mRNA. So what we did was to um, take isolate, this was done uh, all by Rosella, and um, we isolated the vesicles from the medium of the size of exosome. And uh, Giuseppina Macaroni in our institute actually ran uh, mass spectrometry on that. So first of all, uh, I forgot to say, we uh, confirmed that the vesicle that we isolated were uh, actually exosome, and indeed by the size and by the markers, they are exosome. And, and Giuseppina then ran the mass back on this, uh, on this sample, and uh, very, very interestingly, we find that Gallus QBP in the exosome uh, isolated from the uh, organs. So then we uh, design an experiment to understand if the exosome, the alkalis TBP that is contained in the exosome is the one that is mediating the phenotype. So Christina, with some help, because this is also a quite complex experiment, you need a lot of hands and a lot of help with the help of Anne and, and Pier Paolo in the lab. Um, what they did was to transfect neuroblastoma with a variety of constructs to generate exosome containing different form of algalis TBP. So one is without, just with a contract for HA tech contract, and the other one was with a control algal and the two mutant form. Then they isolate the exosome from the medium of these neuroblastoma cells, no neuroblastoma, just the medium. Um, then they validated that this exosome actually contained the, uh, the protein. So all the three form of algalis TBP were contained in the exosomes. Then um, then we took prepare mouse cortical slices from mouse and with the organotypic slices and we sprinkle on top uh, the exosomes from all the different conditions. So after a couple of days of you know in, uh, bathing these this, uh, slices with different type of exosomes, so no exosome, HA exosome, and then the three different form of algalic TBP, the analysis was to look for basal radioglia and position of the neurons and very surprisingly we could see that by oh, by sprinkling exosome containing the wild type form of algalis TBP we get 
beta radial glia. And basically, when we put the non-functional exosome, we get again some um, some neurons like in the patient that they are in the progenitors area. So basically, we could say that this phenotype is mediated not just by LGAL STBP, but by the LGAL STBP, which is embedded in the exosomes. And this explains all the non-cell autonomous uh, function. So with that, I come to the conclusion here. So um, we have um, a role of LGAL STBP in secreted exosomes, so is secreted in exosomes, modulate the extracellular space, promote the generation of basal glia, glia from apical radial glia, uh, this increase of um, basal radial glia lead to the formation of folds, and this also influence uh, the position of the neurons. So some of the neurons actually uh, reside at the ventricle. So the next step that we will do is to try uh, to investigate the role of lgal 3 actually on interneurons, which is a different population of cells. So with that, I will actually switch to the second part, which is a bit shorter. Uh, which is starting from disease modeling. I will go quite fast in this first slides because they are, uh, the paper is published, the first part, the second part is new. Um, and so again, in the lab, we are focusing since quite some years in trying to understand neuronal migration disorders in general. And uh, neuronal migration disorder can be classified here in a very simple uh, few uh, classes. So we have lysencephaly type 1, uh, which results in migration defect and smooth brain. Lysencephaly type 2, in which actually neurons migrate too fast and form cobblestones. And then we have the heterotopia. So we have two types of heterotopia, the subcortical band, which is a band of gray matter embedded between the white matter, and periventricular heterotopia in which uh, the, the gray matter actually reside really at the ventricle and can be in nodules like in this case or in uh, in a laminar way so we uh, we investigated more a uh, mechanism of periventricular heterotopia here so this is quite some time ago but Stephen Robertson and I we were collaborating on this uh, on this project uh, he found uh, quite some families with mutation, with novel mutation in genes related to periventricular heterotopia, uh, Daxus and FET4, um, and um, and uh, we studied this uh, these two proteins in the mouse. And we, but I will not tell you about that because it's too old. Um, but the important thing that I want to tell you here is that FET4 and Daxus are two uh, transmembrane proteins, uh, and they have all this cathedral repeat outside, they bind to each other, and they uh, signal to planar polarity pathway and hippo pathway. So what is important here that I want to mention again, so these are cell cell contacts, so also something that is related to extracellular space. So we decided to take uh, two patients. We tried to reprogram more, but in the end, we decided to take only two. Uh, one that is a patient that is homozygous mutation for Daxus-1, and the other one is a compounded heterozygous uh, mutant for FET4. And um, in addition to that, and I will not show you all the data because it's just too much, uh, we also generate a knockout, isogenic line with knockout of FET4 and Daxos to be sure that this was nothing to do with just different genetic background. But I will show you the patient data. So we took the uh, cells from uh, control and the two mutants that I just mentioned, which have parenteral heterotopia. And what we did was generating organoids. And what we could spot, and we were very happy to see that we could reproduce something that is very similar to the human brain, because we have uh, heterotopia also in the organoids, as you can see here. We quantify a lot of organoids, and basically we subdivide in heterotopia, pure heterotopia, as you can see here, or disorganized ventricles, but definitely uh, much more than the uh, minimal uh, number that we had in the control. So with that model, we thought, and I didn't mention this was a project of Johannes Klaus, my, actually my first PhD student, so with that model, we thought we can actually finally answer a very important question that is there since very long time, and is if this neuronal migration disorder, a specific one, is due to defect in the organization of the stem cells, and then you know due to this defect in morphology, the neurons don't manage to go, or is actually migration of the neurons that is impaired in this case. So we started by looking at the neural stem cells here. Um, so we did quite some standing. Again, I will go a bit fast because this is published, and as you can can see very well um, when you look at the oops, when you look at the morphology of, uh, of the cells in the Daxus and FET4. This we did it in different ways. So we use patient organoid, but we also downregulated um, acutely using microRNA, and we also use knockout organoids. But in any case, whenever you look at the 
processes of the radial glia by modifying the, the levels or mutating the expression of fat for axles, you have this very distorted morphology of um, the radial glia. So suggesting that the radial glia could misguide actually the neurons. So what we uh, then look was if the position of the neurons, the aberrant neurons was actually close to this position of aberrant radial glia. And you can see here very nicely, here you have the radial glia that they are screwed up and you can see that neurons accumulate exactly in the same place or here by electroporation without regulated axis one, you can see by in this position that you have this aberrant morphology, you also have MAP2 positive cells accumulating in the same place. So definitely the ectopic neurons and the broken radial glia, they are connected to each other. And definitely we have a component that is neural stem cells in this disease. So again, with, with Barbara and this uh, case, Sabina in her lab, we did a single cell sequencing of these organoids to look at the progenitors first. Um, and what was clear from this, uh, this beautiful analysis that they did was that the progenitors that is here are depicted in yellow, the, the very early apical progenitors, they really differ in the two conditions. So you can see that not only we have very different cells, uh, but it also seems to be uh, more mature. They go a little bit more in the um, basal type of cells. So this was clear that they, um, the, the cell, uh, they were not only distorted at the level of cellular level, but also the molecular level, they have some quite, quite some differences. So at this point, we also wanted to uh, investigate if the neurons have changes. So um, actually, Christina again did some live imaging on these organoids after electroporation. So you can see the green cells and she follow a lot of green cells in slices of organoids and what uh, she measured were a few parameters. So the parameters that we measured of dynamic parameter were the speed, which was strongly increased in uh, both DAXUS and FET for, uh, when we downregulate FET for and DAXUS. Uh, in addition, uh, these cells were uh, a bit more lazy. So they, they had a more stop and go. So they stopped a little bit longer before restarting their movement. And they also didn't move very straightforward, that they moved more in a tortuous manner. So all this uh, suggesting that these cells will migrate with different dynamics. But of course, this is still in the 3D context. So they are still the radial glia. So we also did it in 2D because we thought that this, with this model, we had neurons isolated alone. So we could really look at only at the neurons. And, uh, and this has been done by Johannes. He counted a lot of cells and the result was really identical. So we had a lot of um, cells being slower um resting and stopping for longer time and also not moving so straightforward so uh, by looking at this uh, the advantage of having so many cells was well, that by looking and looking at this uh, at these uh, cells especially with a, with a good friend uh, mariana schroeder that was at that time also involved in the project, uh, we uh, we noticed that there were some cells actually behaving a little bit differently, why some of them, they seem to be much similar to control. So what we did was uh, doing a cluster um, analysis and when by putting all these three parameters together, and you can clearly see that when you look at controls, you have two behavior, right? So you have the blue and the gray here, only one cell actually was close to behavior number three. So they seem to split in two uh, different behavior. Well, when you look at the DAXUS1 or FET4 uh, mutant cells, they seem to acquire a new uh, type of behavior that we call cluster three. It's not something that we can really define, um, but is they, they cluster in another way. And especially the DAXUS cells were kind of a lot because they were like 20%. So we kind of found that cluster of neurons that behave differently. And why is that so relevant? Uh, from my perspective, it's so relevant because if you look at this, um, MRI scan of the patients. So the majority of the neurons actually migrate to the right place. It's just a few neurons that they don't make it. So suggesting that this, exactly this, may be the neurons that they don't ma make it to the right place. But of course, we had all the single cell data. So with Barbara, we went back and look at this uh, data of the neurons. And if you look carefully, so the mutant cells, and these are the control cells, and amongst the mutant cells, there was a cluster of cells that misbehave here. So we call them 
altered neurons. And if you look carefully, there are also more taxo cells. And if you look at the trajectory, so when you look at control cells, they go from progenitors to neurons with this very straight trajectory. But the FAT4 and the DAXO1 cells, they actually take this additional and alternative trajectory when they become neurons. What is in this alternative trajectory? Um, they have quite some genes that they are dysregulated, mainly axon guidance molecule, neuronal migration molecule, but also synapses and you know function molecules that they could be more related to function. And um, quite some genes were there. We we could confirm Robo3 by doing some staining and see that was actually a little bit more expressed in the uh, organoids from the patient. But what uh, was also very intriguing is, again, to see that many of the molecules, DCC, Robo3, some efferents are really axon guided molecules, that we have some um, synapsis molecule. And then we had this, uh, this uh, fun genes that actually was the top upregulated gene in the altered neuron. So it's expressed in progenitors, but absolutely not in normal neurons, but was highly expressed in these neurons, so suggesting that keep this gene high. And, uh, and actually, uh, is a G-coupled protein. And Anne in the lab was brave enough uh, to study this gene. And actually, she just tried to mimic this heterotopia, these ectopic neurons, by overexpressing this gene in the organoids or in the mouse. And very interestingly, in both cases, we have um, we have actually something that resembles a little bit the uh, the um, the phenotype of uh, the fat for induxus because we have migration defect, we have more neurons in the ventricles, and also when we look at the mouse, neurons migrate less. So, so just by modulating and expressing this gene, we see kind of a partial recapitulation of the phenotype. So now what we want to understand, and this is really the final, uh, final uh, slide, um, if we can also model some of the functional aspect in these organoids, why do we want to do that? Because um, actually, because these patients, they often have seizures, or so patients with cortical malformation are very associated with seizure and epilepsy. So uh, and I actually had a look in all organoids. This is quite old because they are about one year. Just to see, do we have the same cells? Are they all there? Are they all gone? It's all necrotic. Uh, but we actually have still quite some neurons. We have also quite some synaptic marker, uh, presynaptic, postsynaptic. We have some also some uh, interneurons. Uh, so not so organized like before, but we still have quite some cells. And we also have progenitors, as you can see, KS67, SOX2, Nestin, TVR2, and also astrocyte markers or glial markers. So they seem to be quite complex. So that's why uh, um, we started to look at that at the physiological aspect. We, we have a fantastic head of the core facility unit in, in uh, Munich in our institute, Matthias Seder, a wonderful electrophysiologist. And now Francesco in the lab is helping uh, trying to figure out this, this part. So um, what we did, and we still we still at the beginning, we, we do extracellular recording of, of uh, in the organoids. The patch clamp is still quite challenging challenging in the organoids. So we can see that basically by stimulating, uh, for example, the high potassium, we get a response. If we want to block with DTX, we block the uh, activity suggesting that they are functional. We also saw that MDA and GABA receptor are there because we can activate them, we can block them. So suggesting that uh, we have pretty much what is supposed to be there. And really preliminary data. So we are starting now to analyze many more organoids. This is just the beginning. They show that actually there is some changes in the frequency when we do extracellular recording in axis and fat for, um, in fat for organoids. And again, they seem to be that many of the channel are actually similar to control, but then there are always some cluster which are actually different and uh, suggesting again that maybe we have some alter neurons and some that they actually behave uh, normally. So with that, I come to the conclusion. So DAXUS and FAT4 are essential for progenitors identity, are important for radial integrity. They're also very important for modulating neuronal dynamics of a specific population of neurons, not all neurons. And they can also uh, be relevant for regulation of the function um, in human neurons in cerebral organs. With that, I come to the most important slide. So this is the lab. Actually, these are almost all the uh, people that have been touching the lab because um, 
Some of them are already gone. Jan, uh, Johannes left quite some time ago, Isabel very recently, and also Alex left. But these three people were still involved in the project, so I still wanted to mention them. Uh, I presented mainly the work of Christina and also with some help uh, of um, Anne and uh, Johannes. Um, and I would also like to um, thank all the collaborators. I think I've been, I've tried to mention them all during the talk, uh, but this is important because this is a highly collaborative work without uh, all these people and nothing of this would be possible. So I, I always want to take the chance to uh, thank them and uh, the funding and uh, this is the lab now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Silvia. Um, I'll do my my solo clapping, but I'm not the one only one clapping. I, I I can assure you, if you now switch back to the I am trying. to the to the application, you are going to see you know these digital claps. Am I back? <laughs> so thanks a lot for for driving us through this uh, to this really impressive array of data and for sharing also unpublished uh, uh, work um, with us. So, the I time I, did I stop sharing the screen? It's fine. It's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so we now arrive to the Q and A uh, section time of um, of the presentation, and I'm going to basically um, read you a couple of questions. And, and well, it's a discussion. It's supposed to be as interactive as possible. So, um, first uh, question in terms of votes. Great job. Will overexpression of l galas 3 bp in mouse increase the total number of cortical neurons? Also, it looks like the overexpression disrupts some of the mouse cortical layer structure, for example, the PAX6 staining. So um, we didn't really properly quantify the neurons, I have to admit. So we were more looking for the holding. So we, we didn't do a, a proper quantification, but did not look so much increase the number of neurons. Uh, so I cannot really say if the not, total number of neurons is increased. Uh, definitely, we had some kind of change. Uh, as you could see, indeed, the PAC6 positive cells. So I don't think that this um, PAC6 positive cells are disrupted. I simply think that in the position where you have the overexpression of the SGBT, they just move slowly away. This is the position in which they decide to delaminate. And indeed, you see that from that area, there are less cells that they move. And indeed, we never see really a change in number, but simply in location. So I would say that that's the main thing is uh, also in the organics. We don't see changes really in numbers at this point, but mostly we see changes in location. What about the PAC-6? Any changes? The PAC-6 also was quantified by Christina and it's not changed. It's just different position. So it's just spread. So if you quantify and look at bins, she did all the binning analysis. The total mm -hmm. number is the same. It's just the position that is different. Okay. Amazing talk. You mentioned one of the Elgalis 3 p patients had migration abnormalities. What kind of defects? How was this assessed? It's maybe a little bit related. Yes. So um, the migration, the first patient actually that we uh, started to investigate was, was the, our major interest because it was uh, the one that has periventricular heterotopia. It's really a, a patient with periventricular heterotopia. has quite some things, not just periventricular heterotopia. has uh, also um, a profile of autism spectrum disorder. Um, so we were really looking at the migration of the neurons. And as obvious, this time verification changes. So as also seizures, so it's a complex, uh, complex patient. So what we think, and we are not sure about that because we didn't focus in the end, we were so excited about the basal radiaglia, but we didn't focus so much on the mechanism regulating the neuronal migration defect. So we hypothesized, which is not proven at all, we didn't prove that the fact that these cells start expressing, for example, OPEX, so they don't delaminate, they stay down, but they seem to start having some feature of the uh, basal radioglia. Then probably they divide there, right? They divide at the apical surface and they generate neurons that usually are generated here. So these neurons mm -hmm. probably, they may miss some signals because they are at the apical side, they are not in their own niche. And mm -hmm. this is a possibility, but obviously, 
there are millions of other possibilities. Since this regulates the delamination, could also regulate, which we didn't analyze very much in detail, also all the morphology of the process, and this could also result on that. We just speculate on the mechanism of uh, migration defects. Okay, sounds good. Um, great talk. Doesn't the fact that Elgalis 3BP is in exosomes suggest that its function would be more likely in cell-to-cell -cell communication through exosomes rather than in organizing the extracellular matrix from Eduardo Moreto? Yes, um, I agree. It's also, we, we, we think that that's definitely the case. One thing that you have to consider is, first of all, that we found a lot of uh, matrix protein, both in the single cell uh, sequencing and in the protein. Uh, and in the secretome, in every data set that we look, there were collagens, versican, a lot of matrix protein. The other thing that you can imagine that also inside of the exosome, we have done with Giuseppina actually mass spec on this exosome, and we see a lot of collagens, a lot of matrix protein. So it could be uh, that also by having collagens inside of the exosome, you may have different collagens inside, and then you generate some different mm -hmm. environment. So it's can be both. Definitely, we believe that the exosome directly do, does something, but could also be that it's spitting out some matrix protein, which are different in the two cases. So they could be related to something. Okay. Um, question from Fernando Garcia. Thanks, Silvia. Do you know whether HOPEX or Elgalis 3BP control the cell cycle exit of BRGs and or the number of times these cells can divide? No idea about that. So we didn't do any cell cycle analysis, actually. It could be something interesting because it could be also related to cell cycles since the base radiogly may have a different cell cycle. Since we didn't see any change in uh, in number of progenitors, neurons, and all these things, we, we actually didn't focus so much on this uh, transition between progenitors and neurons and fate. Um, but definitely something that we haven't investigated. Yet. OK. Question from uh, Fiona Francis, Elgal mutants, no alterations basally, so interactions, things in, re in, in relationship with interactions with the basement membrane? Hi, Fiona. Um, basement membrane, we didn't see very much when we uh, overexpressed the majority of the time. So we have these two phenotypes. So the majority of the time we are folding, Sometimes we have cobblestones. So the cells kind of, I mean, it's an it's a artificial system, the mouse is not used to have folds. And sometimes we have even broken membrane. Uh, the majority of the time we have still the intact membrane and the process that reached the membrane. Um, so we always excluded the fact that was mostly the basal side was fine. Uh, but actually, you're right, sometimes we have patches of basement membrane that are missing, giving to cobblestones, so it could be. Um, an anonymous question. Be careful, these can be nasty. Uh, cool. <laughs> Starts well. Both from the expression pattern and from the functional implication, Elgas, Elgalis 3BP reminds me of RGAP 11AB. Do you have any, any idea if, how they might relate? Well, actually, I don't think that it's so related because, I mean, I have, I can, you know, discuss this. I mean, initially, it could be because we thought that our GAP11B could be a pro-GTPASIS regulator, but actually has been shown very recently by uh, Takashi Namba that is actually a metabolic uh, influence, the metabolism of the cells. So I guess that these are two very distinct things. The only thing that I can mention is that um, it could go back to metabolism, and uh, but it's just not speculating, even more than speculating, is that our genes that we try to overexpress, that Anne tried to overexpress, this GNG5 is actually expressed in mitochondria and could be also a gene related to metabolism. So we started initially to look at it because it was, seems to be related to metabolism. So this is the only connection that I see at the moment. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Natsuko Omamuda Ishikawa. Uh, great talk. Will overexpression of Elgalis 3 b I'll, I'll, I'll make it once without stuttering. Elgal S three BP in mouse affect um, behavior, or uh, if not, what do you think is needed for the mouse to use? Um, well, that's a hard question. Well, um, what do you think is needed for the mouse to use increased neurons to increase their intellectual abilities? So, um, 
It's a good question. It's not the first time that I, I got this question at this point. It's more intelligent if you look at the behavior. We haven't done anything, so I will uh, not comment more. So we, the maximum stage in which we have uh, waited was until P7 because we were really focusing on the developmental stages. Of course, we are interested in that um, as a possibility of looking how this results in the mouse. So we have two plans. So one is to look a bit more at the later stages to see if they, there is a change in the behavior. Otherwise, it's always a bit difficult because with electroporation, you never know. You eat a small area, big area, and you never know how variable are the samples. The other thing that we were also thinking is to transplant the human cells mm -hmm. with mutant cells or the controlled cells and see actually because it has been shown that there can be different behavior when you uh, transplant enough human cells uh, in the mouse. So this could be an alternative. But again, uh, I have, we have not done anything on that direction yet. Okay. Question from uh, Arthur Brandao. Do you think uh, that your regular cycling behavior can regulate in some way uh, neuronal migration i mean do you think that early and regular physical activity can also alter modulate neuronal migration i guess something relating to input dependent aspects physical neuronal migration physical as physical, physical, physical activity i imagine regular I, i'm not sure there the link with the regular physical activity maybe he's alluding to the biking yeah. or yeah because <laughs> it says cyclic no i don't know I'll take it as a question on input dependent aspects. Do you think there's some extrinsic regulations there beyond what you alluded to? Any reason to think of feedbacks from neurons or? Uh, in neurons, it's not freely expressed, so we don't see it in neurons. So I wouldn't expect that. Uh, even though we force the expression, so in our case, they may have some alkyl stability, but I don't think so because usually it's not expressed in neurons. It's really specific for, for uh, radio glial cells. It's not even expressed, if I remember correctly, in intermediate progenitors in, uh, in TBR2 positive cells. Okay. So there's a question from Urvi Mishra uh, about maybe some dose dependent aspects. So in species where there's less gerification than in humans, do you think? Uh, Algal SVBP would still be involved, and or would it be a different mechanism? So we try to. I mean, we don't have the data set for all the species, of course. And they, what I think would be uh, essential and beautiful would be a pattern expression. So ideally, to have a coronal section of each species, and uh, you know, being able to look if it's localized in certain part. The only work that's been done in this direction. Uh, is the one of Victor, uh, which I mentioned because I think that's very relevant. In general, if you have seen at the beginning, Victor I, Borel, yeah. yes, Victor Borel. So if you have seen this uh, this slide at the beginning, I tried to put in the evolution context by putting the macaque, the chimp, the human, the mouse, and also the ferret. And it's definitely the expression increase the more you go to human. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's difficult to say because I expect that maybe if you take a full brain, you will have different expression, but probably if you go in a specific position of the brain, you will have higher uh, sure. So it's, uh, we don't have enough uh, material to, to have a look at the pattern. So I think that's something very important. Okay. Um, great talk. Have you looked at whether the mutant uh, migratory defects of FAT4 and DAX1 can be rescued? Uh, no, we have not done any rescue there. I mean, the problem of all this stuff that they are also uh, in the membrane is quite difficult because in the fat for reductus uh, organoids as well as in human, we see that not all cells express fat for reductus, right? So you have some cells expressing only fat for, some expressing only reductus, some that express both of them. So you can hypothesize, so I overexpress fat for, I overexpress reductus. But it's going to be difficult because you don't know if you're hitting the right cells and you don't know if you eat the cells that will combine with this receptor mm -hmm. so difficult. the only thing i can say that we have done that in the mouse long time ago and actually the expression of uh, daxus in the mouse could rescue the down regulation of daxus in the mouse okay uh, last question perhaps uh, hello one of your results shows a possible interaction with rac1 signaling do you think it could be a better target, well, I guess, or an alternative target, uh, instead of a beta catenin to uh, explain the actin dysregulation? It's obviously possible. So 
um, this this data actually where um, so we had this this a lot of data on metrics and um, actin regulators. So we try to go really at the end in the actin and beta catenin because this this whole cascade can be modulated in so many places, right? Including obviously a RAC raw. I mean, obviously a raw GDPAs is are candidate kind of number one for modulation of actin and. Uh, and cytoskeleton, we actually haven't done the activity test, but we, since we have done it before, we could do the activity test um, for that. And look, um, if I remember correctly, we did uh, some activity tests on GP, GTPSs, and they was not very clear. But obviously, if you do it in the all organoids, you don't take in consideration the cell type, which may be misleading. You may lose uh, the change in the activity by taking all the cells together. Okay. Uh, maybe one last question. Do you have a reference for somebody's interested in isolating the exosomes? What's the what's the um, protocol for that? Is there a reference or something? So there were there are quite some papers on isolated exosome. Actually, uh, we we use a combination of uh, different papers to isolate the exosome, but it's a very simple. I mean, they are kits, but they are also isolation based on um, ultra centrifugation steps. Um, I, and not tell you the person. Yeah, so later, the person can yeah. contact you. But you definitely you can contact me. We will definitely sh share the protocol. We are happy to share the protocol. Okay, thank you. All right, Sylvia, we're, we're reaching the end of this um, of this session. So thanks again. It was really a, a pleasure to have you here to hear you present uh, this this exciting work and uh, upcoming publications. Thank you to all of you who were here uh, today. We'll see each other. Uh, next week, same time, same place, at least for me, uh, for the place. Um, and uh, it will be um, Maria Tosquez from, um, from Columbia University who will be telling us about her work next week, uh, some interesting uh, EvoDevo discussions and perspectives. So hope uh, to see all of you and even more um, next week. And until then, have a good weekend and, uh, and a good week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much also from my side. Bye-bye. Ciao.